from its time as a boys school to its time as a sanatorium and now as a haunted attraction, St. Albans Sanatorium has seen a lot of history and it's known as one of the most active places on the east coast. And for me, it is the scariest and most active location I've ever investigated. So what makes it so haunted and what is the history behind St. Albans Sanatorium? Today let's dive into the dark history of this building. I'm going to start off by reading to you a newspaper article from the Atlanta Constitution, which is dated July 2nd, 1893. On a sunny headland above the banks of New River in the beautiful bluegrass region of southwestern Virginia is situated St. Albans School for Boys. There was no law compelling its location there extent the law of health. It is on the plan of the English high schools, the German gymnasium, the French lycee. A private individual, Mr. George W. Miles Jr., put up the buildings, which will accommodate 50 boys. They are in the old colonial style of architecture, and with the wide verandas, the white columns, the classic gables, they look like old James River mansions of over 100 years ago. The school is an ornament to Virginia. Mr. Miles, the headmaster, is but 30 years of age, and yet he was for 10 years a professor in Emory and Henry College before founding this school. The idea of the school is that of an educational home for boys, where they can have every comfort and protection, where they can get out of the cities with their temptations and distractions, and where they can have the ripest of university scholars to teach them and associate with them. There are four masters in addition to Mr. Miles. There are graduates from the University of Virginia, from Princeton, and from the University of North Carolina. Professor Smith, Peters, Venable, and Humphreys testify to the scholarship of the University of Virginia man. The Princeton professors are equally cordial about their man, and the University of North Carolina professors say that their man has no superior and few, if any, equals. It is a rare combination of brilliant, energetic young scholars. It must be a slow, dull boy who will not have his mental processes quickened and his life made better from daily association with such teachers. Along with the scholarship, the school's athletics are of the first water. Mr. Simmons, the center player of the Princeton Varsity 11, will coach and play on the football team. Mr. Murray McGuire, one of the greatest of the amateur pitchers and captain of the champion University of Virginia 9, will coach and play on the baseball team. It is musty foggyism to shake the head at football and baseball, at tennis and rowing, provided they are held in proper bounds and not allowed to encroach on the study hours. And to do this, the headmaster holds himself responsible to the patrons of the school. The English schools have had their teams for over a hundred years, and it has helped them turn out the robust, indefatigable, invincible Englishmen of today. There are Atlanta boys who should be in such a school at St. Albans. Southern boys go to college and university too soon and too young. Of the 41 boys at St. Albans last session, 13 of them were from Georgia. And this was, of course, from, like I said earlier, a newspaper article from Atlanta. So George Miles was putting out the flyers all over the South, trying to get the best and smartest at his school. George Miles founded the school after 10 years as a professor at Emory and Henry, as stated above. And he built the place to accommodate 50 boys in order to prepare them for university or business life. The school was founded on the premise that boys have an educational home away from the temptations and distractions of a city. The school started out very successfully. Many of the prominent families of the region sent their boys there for a top education to prepare them for life. And the school also gained a strong reputation as one of the best athletic schools around. The school did have its dark sides though. St. Almonds quickly gained a reputation for being a rough and competitive school where bullying was encouraged. Many of the boys were lost during the years of operation. These lost boys were enshrined in the Promus, which was the school's year yearbook, with a picture and written snapshot of that boy's character. It has been said that there were several suicides and homicides at the school during its operation, but there are no known records to back this up. George Miles died in 1903, and the school started to see a drop in students. A 
as the 19 teens approached the school was really losing students and reputation, and in 1911, the school closed. Dr. John C. King was born April 29, 1871, in Henry County, Virginia. He served as part of the medical staff at Southwestern Lunatic Asylum, later known as Southwestern State Hospital. Prior to being appointed as superintendent on December 8, 1908, while he served on the medical staff, he was in charge of the mail service. In 1902, Dr. King was instrumental in having the name of the facility changed from Southwestern Lunatic Asylum to Southwestern State Hospital because he felt that the name sounded too bad. Under Dr. King's administration, an amusement hall was built in 1908, and the Tubercular College was completed in 1912, which housed 50 patients. We were fled from their own kitchen due to the shortage of money and timber at the time. Permission was given by the board of directors to cut and burn the wood from the trees in the old sugar orchard to make the bricks for the building. Also under King's administration, the General Assembly voted to locate a building for the care and treatment of the criminally insane in Marion, Virginia. The two-story building was completed in 1911 and was designed with the idea of giving patients and those confined awaiting trial or under observation every opportunity for exercise and freedom of movement. Apparently not satisfied with how things were going at the Marion facility, Dr. King resigned as superintendent of Southwestern State Hospital on November 10, 1915 and set out to realize his vision of a facility that could produce a higher percentage of recovery for mentally ill patients. With $500 of his own money and $16,000 in borrowed funds, Dr. King set up a corporation and acquired the buildings in 56 acres of land known as the St. Albans School for Boys in Radford, Virginia. The buildings were thoroughly renovated, and on January 15, 1916, four patients were admitted to St. Albans Sanatorium. St. Albans Sanatorium opened on January 15, 1916, when four patients were admitted to the sanatorium. In its early days, the sanatorium had financial troubles, but Dr. King refused to give up. With the support of his wife, he further expanded the hospital and its services. The growth of the population from nearby settlements rose, and this meant that the patient numbers increased. In the tradition of other treatment facilities of the time, St. Almond's Sanatorium included a farm which, according to an old brochure, affords ample space for out-of-door games. Diversional exercises and employment, also vegetable and flower gardens, an adequate dairy herd, and extensive poultry raising, all of which are interesting and helpful to the patients. St. Albans Sanatorium struggled initially with financial problems as stated earlier. However, Dr. King and his wife did not want to lose the building or its patients, for he really believed in his vision. The building of the Radford Arsenal and the rapid population growth associated with it had a profound impact on the sanatorium. Patient numbers rose, and since it was the only hospital in the community at the time, it also provided general medical care. To accommodate all these patients, the staff worked six days a week while living in quarters provided by the hospital. By 1945, the total number of patients treated during its first 29 years was 6,509, and its staff numbered only 48. The hospital continued to grow in the following decades. St. Albans became a fully recognized hospital in 1960 and started opening outpatient clinics in Roanoke, Blacksburg, and Beckley, West Virginia. In 1980, in order to stay up to date with advancing technology, parts of St. Albans were relocated into a more modern $8 million facility. In the late 1980s, the institution of the New River was the Commonwealth's only private full-service not-for-profit psychiatric hospital. It was a source of pride for many people living in Radford and Pulaski County. Many different practices were practiced inside the building. A hydrotherapy session didn't always include a brief, relaxing soak in the bathtub. Patients who weren't mummified in icy cold towels were strapped into steaming water vats where they lay immobile and confined for days. Others were blasted with water from a fire hose. 
and when cutting people's skulls open proved ineffective, doctors opted to simply shock them to their senses. Schizophrenics, for instance, were given electroconvulsive therapy, which was deemed safer than insulin coma therapy. Still, ECT had many possible dangerous after effects, including fractures, severe memory loss, and spontaneous seizures. Vulnerable patients were subjected to cruel experimental treatments. People were left permanently disabled or even killed by lobotomies or insulin-induced comas. Others were shocked via electroshock therapy, and the desperately small staff and inhumane living conditions led the building to witness many, many suicides. In the 1990s, the Carilion Health System acquired St. Albans Sanatorium, but vacated the building in 2003. People report seeing full-bodied apparitions, shadowy figures, and levitating objects while exploring the building. Others claim to hear voices or even feel fleeting physical contact with unseen beings. There are many rooms in the sanatorium that are paranormally active. The bowling alley in the basement, for instance, is known to be haunted by two female spirits, Allie and Gina Renee Hall. Allie is rumored to be the young daughter of one of the hospital's patients, and Gina was a woman who was murdered on June 28, 1980, somewhere close to St. Albans Sanatorium along Hazel Hollow Road. Some people believe that Gina's body could be buried in the walls of the lower levels of St. Albans near the boiler room, where the infamous goat man has been seen. Another spirit of the boiler room is Smokey, who was a maintenance man who allegedly raped and killed women in the boiler room. People have heard disembodied conversations, screams, and footsteps inside these areas as well as other parts of the building. Some have even seen objects levitate, move on their own, disappear, and have also been pushed by invisible forces. While the building was vacant, it is said that a satanic group took over the building and performed many rituals inside. Some of these rituals are said to have been sacrifices, summoning rituals, guardian rituals, and many more. The graffiti and symbols from the group and their rituals can still be found inside certain rooms. There are also some dark entities and inhuman creatures that are said to roam the building. These include the Crawler, which is a humanoid type entity that stalks and even charges people, Hellhounds, Demons, the Goat Man, and the Muffin Man, which is a doppelganger that takes the shape of one of the volunteers who dressed up as a bloody Muffin Man for a haunted house one year. Donald and Jacob are both known to haunt Jacob's room, and Donald was said to have sexually assaulted Jacob to death when the building was a sanatorium, and he chases people away from Jacob's room so they can't talk to Jacob. Rebecca is said to haunt Rebecca's room, and she was a patient who got pregnant by one of the sanatorium employees, and her child died during childbirth, but she kept the body in a jar and hid it from staff members until about a week after the baby died, when the staff took the jar away. Rebecca hung herself from the window. There are many more spirits that are said to haunt here, and I've encountered many of them myself. Some of these experiences and other things I've encountered are the well-known Whistler, of the second floor hallway adjacent to Jacob's room. Some people say that when you're in the hallway or in other parts of the floor, you can hear a whistle. And if you whistle back, you can strike up almost a back and forth whistling with this spirit. And the whistler is said to be the spirit of a child who died in the children's ward on the second floor hallway of the King Center. Some of my experiences also include having heard Rebecca both over the spirit box and with my own ears in Rebecca's room during an investigation. I have encountered the goat man. We were, my dad and I, we were investigating the boiler room with two other people during an event, and I kept seeing something move out of the corner of my eye in the back corner. So finally, I got really angry at it because, you know, I would see it, and then when I would turn to face or point my camera that way, it would vanish. And then I'd turn back, not pay attention to it, and it would happen again. And it always went from right to left and then left to right. And it was only in this one certain area in the back corner behind some machinery. So finally, I got mad, and I took a voice recorder, stuck it out in front of me about half a foot, and I said, I'm coming back there, wherever you are, whoever you are, make your presence known, now. 
and as I got towards the back corner, I heard this very loud hiss, followed by the smell of wet fur. And this hiss was so loud, we recorded it on our voice recorder, and the other voice recorder picked it up, which it was next to the spear box, and the hiss drowned out the loud static of the spear box itself. Another one of my encounters, which is the scariest encounter I've ever had in the paranormal, was in the second floor hallway next to the Whistler's room. And this is when I saw a seven, seven and a half foot tall blob creature that somehow was able to mess with time to where a 10 minute experience only lasted about two minutes for everyone else. But on our voice recorders, it's a full 10 plus minutes. I have also smelled dog's fur in the alcoholics ward where people have reported hellhounds. I have seen the crawler twice and something has charged me not once but twice during an investigation on camera Facebook live stream in the bird cage of St. Albans Santorium, which is where pretty much the toughest and the tough of the patients were kept so that they could have outdoors time without being able to really hurt anyone but themselves. From its start as a boys school to its time as a sanatorium, St. Albans Sanatorium has seen some dark things happen within its walls and the echoes of the past can and are still heard today. This is the most active and scariest location not only in Virginia I've investigated, but all over America I've investigated. And if you ever investigate there, be ready for anything to happen.